I've always been fascinated by very efficiently programmed games or demos. The Atari 2600 is an interesting example on its own since the early games like Pac-Man had to fit in 4K of ROM. While later cartridges ended up using bank switching to get 8K or even more, the early games really had to be coded very efficiently and often meant sacrificing complex features of the game. But if you think 4K would be tough to code for, how about 2K? <laughs> My friend Robin Harbin coded this little game called Minima, which is a play on words for the Ultima games. It's a little role playing game that fits in 2K of code. <laughs> Very impressive, but um, can you get even smaller? Well, yeah. Uh, here's another one. This is called Splatform, and it fits in a meager 1K of RAM. So to put things in perspective, how much is 1K exactly? Well, each of these dots represents a single byte, and here's 1024 of them. Now, your typical assembly language instruction takes up anywhere from 1 to 3 bytes, so you could probably have a total of around 400 actual instructions, but that wouldn't leave any room for data, graphics, sound, or even text, so it'd be a very delicate balance between instructions and data. But what about even smaller than this? Indeed, could games be written in just 512 bytes of RAM? It turns out... Yes, they can. In fact, 512 bytes is a magic number because that means it can fit into a boot sector. So just a refresher here from my floppy disk documentary from a couple of years ago. Your typical 360K floppy disk for an IBM or compatible has 40 tracks starting from the outer rim to the inner core. And then the disk is divided up into nine sectors like this. And the boot sector is the first sector of track zero. And as you can see, it's a very small portion of the disk's surface. Of course, that's a 360K disk. What about the more common 1.44 megabyte floppy disk that most people are familiar with? That format has twice as many tracks and twice as many sectors, but a single sector is still just 512 bytes. So that means it's even a smaller portion of the disk surface. So what does the boot sector do? Well, the BIOS is a ROM chip on the motherboard, but that's not really an operating system. So the BIOS has just enough code to read the boot sector into RAM and then execute it. But the boot sector isn't big enough to contain a whole operating system. So its purpose is to load the real operating system into RAM, such as DOS, Windows, or Linux. You might be surprised to find that, uh, at least on IBM PC and compatible computers, Every floppy disk and hard disk has a boot sector, and there's a program installed on every boot sector, even if the disk is blank. Have you ever accidentally left a floppy disk in the drive during boot and see the message that says, invalid system disk, replace the disk and press any key? Now, you might think this message is coming from the BIOS ROM, and that would be a good guess. But if that were the case, then how would you explain this? When I put a different blank disk in, the message changes. Now it says, non-system disk or disk error. Well, what's the difference? Well, the first disk was formatted with Windows 95, and the second disk was formatted with MS-DOS. And that message you see on the screen is actually a small program in the boot sector of an otherwise blank disk, which displays this message. Using a sector editor, you could actually change this message to anything. For example, I changed the message on the Planet X3 disk so that it says a custom message, and then continues to boot to your hard drive if you have one. Boot sectors were also historically targeted by viruses. The viruses were just small programs that lived in the boot sector, and then they would load the operating system afterwards, and then they would copy themselves to either the boot sector on your hard drive or other floppy disks. And because the virus loaded in the boot sector, that means it loaded before the operating system, giving it a higher level of control. Now that you definitely know what a boot sector is, can you imagine how hard it would be to write an actual game that fits in just 512 bytes? Well, what I have here is a Space Invaders game written by Oscar Toledo, and the whole thing is on the boot sector. And I want you to watch how quickly this boots up. Now, keep in mind, it hasn't even finished the power on self-test yet. And there it is. I want to illustrate this from a different angle. See there, that's the floppy disk light during the test cycle. And the next time you see that light, that means it's trying to boot. So watch how quickly the game starts after you see the light. It's super fast, not only because there's no operating system to load first, but because the drive's head doesn't even have to seek. Literally all it takes is a single revolution of the disk to get the boot sector read into system RAM. Of course, this isn't the best version of Space Invaders ever. It's very clear that many concessions were made. For example, there's no scoreboard, no UFO across the top, and the, all the aliens look exactly the same. Oh, and there are no sound effects or music either, but still, you can't deny the skill involved to make this fit in a boot sector. 
So besides Space Invaders, what other games are out there? This is another one. It's called F-Bird, and if it isn't obvious, it's a knockoff of Flappy Bird. Only this version runs in text mode, using only ASCII characters for the graphics. One interesting thing about this game is that I think it's the only one I have to show you today that actually has sound effects of any sort. Here's another one. Uh, this is called Pill Man. I guess because he eats so many little pills. With all those ghosts chasing him, I uh, hope they're Xanax. Anyway, uh, this one also runs in VGA graphics mode, but there's something I find very interesting about it. If you look down in the bottom left corner, you'll see some weird flashing pixels. And it looks like about 20 of them. And I suspect what's happening here is that the author of the game is using the extra screen RAM as variable space for the game. And you can actually see specific changes, for example, when Pillman changes direction. Which means uh, this game may only need a couple dozen bytes of RAM for variables. Uh, it's really blurry trying to zoom into these from a screen capture, but uh, here's a still shot from DOSBox. This is reminiscent of the Atari 2600 since it only had 128 bytes of RAM. Speaking of DOSBox, uh, many people may be wondering how I'm booting a raw disk image like this from DOSBox. Well, it's actually quite easy. So once you have DOSBox open, you just type the command boot followed by the path to the disk image you want to use, in this case Tetros. I assume that's an amalgamation of the word Tetris and operating system since the game is its own operating system. So yeah, this is a very playable version of Tetris that uh, fits completely in a boot sector. There are other things besides games. Uh, for example, this is a functional version of BASIC that runs from a boot sector. Now, this is one of the example programs you can type in, which creates a Pascal triangle. Now, this version of BASIC is very limited, however. It has a very limited command set, and each line can only be 19 characters long. So, you aren't going to be able to make anything super exciting. Uh, plus, I don't think there's any way to load and save your work. Okay, now, being realistic for a moment, none of these games are that great, in, in that you're not going to want to sit down and just play them for hours on end. Um, I suspect that the people who wrote the games uh, probably had more fun writing them than they did playing them. And, of course, that's the whole point of these games, is to challenge oneself to see, you know, how much you can fit into a very confined space. And uh, so I just, I have a great admiration for anyone who can fit a game into 512 bytes of RAM. So, uh, but uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's actually all I've got for this episode. So um, uh, stick around for the next one and thanks for watching.